I'm glad to be in church. Amen. Nowhere else I'd rather be than in church. Yes, Amen. Glad to have a preacher come to preach. Amen. Amen. I want you to do me a favor tonight. I, I want you to just listen and let God speak. Okay? Okay? I want you to let God minister to you. And I want you to let him do whatever he, the, the Lord has sent this preacher to do. Because I can tell you right now, I know his heart. And there's nothing more in the world he'd rather do than be a help to you from the Lord. He, he's, he's 37. He's 37? 36. 36 years old. I used, to think, I used to think that I was a young man, but I'm 44. And I look back, well, I don't feel like a young man when I look back at 36, amen? <laughs> amen? And I remember 36 very vividly and very plainly. And uh, I see the fire in him, and it reminds me of where I was eight years ago. And I don't ever want to lose that fire. Amen? amen? And I'm excited to hear him preach tonight. Amen. So you pray for him tonight as he comes. Pray that God will use him and it will be a blessing and a help to you. I'm going to pray and I want you to come, brother. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you this night. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Lord, I thank you most of all for your love. For your love that sent Jesus into the world. Lord, to be hated and scorned of men. To be crucified to die for our sins. I'm thankful, Father, for that blood that was poured out on Calvary's hill that covered my sin debts. Lord, I'm thankful for the forgiveness I find. Lord, I'm thankful for heaven which was purchased for me. Lord, I just ask you please. Lord, I know that the same love that poured forth from Calvary pours forth from the lips of this preacher. Lord, because it's your love. Lord, I pray for the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to rest on this preacher tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd give us something tonight that will wake us up from our, from our slumber. Oh, God, resurrect our, uh, our, our, our slumbering spirits. Lord, I pray the Holy Ghost of God manifest himself in a mighty and powerful way through the preaching of the word tonight. Put your hand upon this preacher. Give him unction and use him for Christ's honor and glory. I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the Lord will speak to your heart if you let him, amen, if you listen. And uh, I had all prepared what I thought I was going to preach to you when I, when I um, came up here. Um, but uh, I believe the Lord has changed that here <laughs> in, in just the last few minutes. Um, let, let me tell you that the devil wants to shut you, shut you down. He wants to wound the servants of God. You know, he, he wants to plague them and uh, keep them from doing what he's called them to do. Um, and uh, that, that happens a lot. And if, you, if you've preached at all or done the work of God at all, you'll understand that, that the devil loves nothing better than to hinder the, the servants of Christ. He wants to damage them and ruin them so they can't do, do anything for him. That's, that's his goal. And, uh, uh, but we know where the victory lies, and, and uh, we understand that. I, I was going to preach a message to you that I'm, I, I, the Lord's leading me a different direction tonight, and I wouldn't plan on preaching what I'm going to do to you, but I'm going to anyway, because that's what the Lord's speaking to my heart about. Uh, Brother Brandon asked me, what was, what was your favorite song? He said, what's your favorite hymn? And he asked me that, and it's interesting to me, because when, when they were singing Rock of Ages, that is really one of my favorite hymns. I sing it to my children all the time. I can't sing it all either. So you know i got to love it if I'm going to sing it. But... Uh, Amen, because it's bad when I sing it, but it certainly doesn't sound as good as it sounded earlier, amen, and what a blessing that was, but I, the Lord is leading me to preach my testimony to you when I got saved, and, and what the Lord did in my life. I was going to preach you something else, but I can't, I can't get out of it, amen, God's, God's really burdened my heart for it, and I've got one verse for you here, and then I'm going to pray, and I'm going to, I'm going to you know, there'll be other verses in this testimony, but I want to tell you 
what the Lord's done in my life. I really want to testify what God has done. And I'm not preaching myself here. I'm preaching Christ and Him crucified. Uh, let's pray. Father, I need You. Lord, uh, may Your power go forth. May You be honored and glorified in Your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I, I want to tell you what the Lord did in my life. Uh, you know, I, I grew up much. I I'll give you a background here. Uh, that verse means a lot to me because of the way I grew up and the way uh, things that had happened to me and befell me in my past when I was a boy. Uh, I grew up in, a, in, a, uh, in an independent Baptist church at first. Uh, my parents, when I was a little boy, went to went to uh, a, a independent Baptist church, much like this one here, and uh, a little bit bigger than this, obviously, and bigger than the church that I pastor, but uh, they had a big old Christian school and everything, and big ministries and all that, and we got in there into the, into the church, and, and uh, the Lord had, when I was a five-year-old boy, I made a profession of faith, but I wasn't saved. I didn't understand that I was a lost, hell-deserving sinner. Amen. And that's the difference. You must understand that you're a lost, hell-deserving sinner. Not just that you want to go to heaven, but that you're a lost, hell-deserving sinner. And, and, and that you deserve to burn in hell for all of eternity. Amen. You must understand that to be born again, you've got to know that. Jesus Christ said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. And that if you'll be a sinner, then you'll be qualified for heaven. Amen. But if you won't be a sinner, then you're not qualified for heaven. Amen. Because he didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinners. But as I grew up as a, as a, as a little boy and, and uh, five years old and made that four years old, I actually didn't even remember making that profession really that clearly. Wasn't that clear to me. My father and mother had told me, well, yeah, you got saved when you were four or five years old. Uh, parents, let me warn you about something. Grandparents, wherever you are, don't tell your grandkids or your children they're saved. Don't do that. You can, if they've made a profession of faith, if they've trusted Christ as their Savior, then, then by all means you can, you can ask them their testimony, you can be an encouragement to them, but don't pronounce them saved. You're not God. Amen? Amen? You could damn a soul to, to hell for all of eternity by playing games with somebody's soul. Be careful about that. Don't do that to people. Uh, anyway, listen, I, I, I grew up and I, and I was, I, I, uh, my parents got, got on the outs with the church. And they, 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 the, the church, this church wounded them bad. That goes on a lot, by the way. There's a lot of mean people out there. And uh, I'll tell you what, if any denomination will eat their own, it's Baptists that will eat their own, man. They'll chew them up, spit them out, and puke them back up again, you know, if you let them. I mean, there's some mean people. They're meaner than rattlesnakes sometimes, Baptists can be. And uh, I'm just telling you the truth, folks. That is the honest truth. You travel around a little bit, you have some problems come up in your life, you'll find out who your friends are, amen? You'll find out who will be after you. Um, and who will love you and who will care for you and who will just say, well, I can't have anything to do with you because you're a sinner. Amen? Come on. But anyway, I was, a, I was a young boy and I grew up and, and, uh, and my parents, I'll tell you what, we, we got out of that church when, we were, when I was about eight or nine years old, and, or excuse me, ten years old about, and started going into the public school system. First thing they did was put me in the public school. And uh, uh, when I left the Christian school, went in the public school, wasn't but a year, I was... I was uh, I was smoking cigarettes, sitting out back smoking cigarettes, came from a, you know, I, by the way, this, this doesn't make sense to me at all, but brother, when I was five years old, four years old, I was preaching on a stump somewhere, and I, I told my dad that I was going to be a preacher someday. Now, boy, I'll tell you what, I don't understand any of that, and I couldn't explain it to you or anything in this world, but, I, but, but that God had his hand on me long ago. It wasn't anything to do with me. But it was God. I remember the the uh, my, my I had some some uh, mentally handicapped stepsisters and and, and uh, they had they they always had fits and problems and everything and the and the uh, the uh, the uh, we call them the the Department of uh, Children and Family Services came in and they 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 started quizzing all the kids and they broke them all uh, spit them all apart like interrogation you know like the Nazis do and they and they and they, I don't care they're a bunch of Nazis anyway. I'm not offending anybody, but if I am, you might need to get right with God. A anyway, um, they, they're, a bunch of, they're a bunch of Nazis. Anyway, they separate them all apart. And they say, well, listen, we want to grill you and find out what, col what color your French fries or what color your, your, your coloring book is, your, what color your bed is, what your mom and dad said last night to you and all this stuff. And I looked at them and I said, it's none of your business. 
It ain't none of your business. You can get out of here. I was fighting the beast at five years old, amen? But uh, uh, anyway, and God, but, but God had been dealing with my heart that time. But from that time on to 10 years old and smoking cigarettes, wasn't very long. Years went, a few years went by and wasn't very long at all. I was already drinking. I mean, I wasn't even a teenager and I was drinking. I was messing around with things. On into the teenage years, pornography came next. I wasn't, even, I wasn't even out of junior high, and I was taking pornography to school and selling pornography magazines to teenagers, to other, or to, to older kids and to other kids in the class. Life was totally wicked. I preached a sermon called Burning an Image, Never to be Erased. And my friend, let me warn you of something about pornography or anything else. Don't you look at something you're not supposed to. Because someday you'll want to do right and bad images will come up in your head and you'll never get them out. Because it burns an image never to be erased. It's stuck there and it doesn't go anywhere. You know, guard your eyes. Keep your eyes pure. Don't, don't let them see evil. Set no unclean thing before your eyes. I was a young boy and I, I, I started getting into things and, and hanging around the wrong people. Wasn't long, the pornography, and then running around with the wrong crowd, and pretty soon it ended up being drugs. I was smoking marijuana. I was doing, doing, uh, uh, doing other drugs and everything else and running around and, and uh, uh, just living a debauched, wicked life with no hope. You wouldn't even be able to find Christ anywhere in my life if you, had the F you sent the FBI to find him. You wouldn't have found him anywhere in my life. Nowhere in my life at all. And my friend, let me tell you something. I wasn't saved, and I know I wasn't saved at that time, but let me tell you something. When you go from here to there, it can happen like that. When you start sinking down into the depths of sin and wallowing in your own sin in the pig, it's not long before you are a pig in the pig pen. And you're going to be ruined. Your life will be destroyed. You and I can ruin our lives just like that in a second. That quickly. That's how easy and fast sin works. Well, anyway, I, I, as I, as I uh, grew up and, and uh, got into my teenage years, and, and I had no conscience really of doing wrong, and I stole and... I would go to the store and I would steal things and I would, I, I would steal cigarettes and I would steal candy and everything else. You know, a 12-year-old kid stealing cigarettes, running around. Um, mother was not home. Mom was working. Dad sent mom to work too. My dad was a hard worker, but my father didn't understand a lot about family principles. They came from, they were a bunch of river rats. That's where they came from. They didn't have any upbringing. His mom had to work just to make it. His father had black lung. He was dying. Just, his father was a drunk. My, my father never, he didn't drink. He wasn't a drunk and he didn't beat my mother or anything like that. He, you know, compared to his, 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 uh, uh, his father, he was a saint. But they, they let us go. A child left to himself bringing his mother to shame. And oh, did I bring my mother shame. I got into everything you could imagine. I, I got into uh, to, uh, uh, drugs and pornography and everything else. And as time went by, I was hanging around the wrong folks. And, and uh, uh, you know, by the time I was in my teenage years, I, 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 didn't, want anything, I didn't have anything to do with God at all. Uh, morality and biblical holiness or modesty, none of that mattered to me. I, I didn't, I, it wasn't that I was railing against it. It was that it didn't... I, it was lost in me. I was a lost man. I always understood what happened when I was younger. Uh, you know, that I went to church when I was younger, but I knew I wasn't saved. You know, I had doubts about it all the time. and never really, no, nothing in my life that really stuck. And that profession never stuck because it wasn't real. It wasn't, I didn't remember it. And I started getting into the world and, and uh, growing up and, and uh, making money. Was, was fornicating with a girl, living with a girl, and and uh, ha had a girlfriend at the age of 19 and was living with her and, and uh, uh, you know, li living with her and had talked her into, she, she just turned 18, I was about 20, she had just turned 18 and I had talked her into moving out of her parents' house and, 
As soon as she turned 18 and she was legal, I had all planned it to get her out of her house, and it worked, and, and I got her out of her house, and I was fornicating, and I, I, had, I had finally gotten a good job and started making money, and, and, and you know, I, I lived my life I, as, a, as a 19-year-old boy, a 19-year-old young man, I, I was making fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. I started selling vacuum cleaners, of all things, door-to-door -door on a straight commission, and I found out I was really good at it. And, uh, and after a while, they had me managing stores at 19, 20 years old. They had me managing two or three different stores for them, traveling around, winning trips of winning uh, $5,000, $6,000 and making money and, and uh, you know, j just having the respect of people and, and out running around living, living for myself. Had all kinds of money, but a bunch of sorrow that went with it. A bunch of wicked sin that was tied to me that went with it, that followed me wherever I went. No peace from God. None. I mean, you would think I had the luxury vehicle. I had the girlfriend. I had all that this stinking world had to offer. But I had no peace. Because there's no peace for the damned. There's no peace for the wicked. None. None. So I lived my life and, and, and at a young man's age and made money and traveled around and did some things, went to Mexico, got Cancun and on uh, flights and won cruises and all kinds of crazy things. And, and uh, you know, little did I know that God was starting to, starting to move in my parents' life. Back home, dad was sitting there and he was sitting in the house one day, and God had smote his heart. All of a sudden, he'd been out of church for 15 years. And he sat down at the table, and he said, The Lord, as if it wasn't an audible voice, but it was as good as one, and you all know what I'm talking about when the Lord speaks to you. And he said to my dad, If you don't go back to church, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take you out of here because you're of no use to me here. And I will take you home. There is a sin unto death. And I do not say we should pray for it. And God began to deal with my father's heart. And now you can call this coincidence, but I believe the Bible. A knock came on the door. It was the preacher. He knocked on the door, and he said, you know, I was going to invite you to church. He said, isn't that a funny thing, because I'm going to come. The first time he missed it, but the second service, the second time he didn't miss it, and he got there. And God began dealing with my father's heart about getting back to God and getting his life straight, because his two sons were living like absolute heathens. We were both into drugs, we were both running around, we were both living for ourselves, we were both living in fornication and wickedness. We were in all manner of evil. My brother had gotten a felony, and, and his life, this was years, years before that, had gotten in trouble and had some problems with the law, and, uh, you know, we, we were heading in a bad direction. Hey, I was, uh, during all this time, I was dealing drugs. I was running drugs. You know, I, the Lord spared me. I, I deserve, I deserve hell. Don't you look down on people that have been to jail, because I deserve to go there too. They're just as rotten and wicked as anybody that's in there. And if I got caught for everything I did, I'd be there too. But so would half your politicians that put them in jail too. And then wicked crony judges that do it too. And these legislators and some of these rotten lawyers. These district attorneys that pressure people and get them to sign plea deals when they're a bunch of lying sc scum buckets is what they are. Amen. I've seen them. The railroad people in a courtroom and railroad people in a back room. Did well, listen, you don't take the plea deal. You're going to... I mean, you could get 40 years for this. You'd get 25 years for this. You'll never see the light of day again. 
Anyway, that's another side. Listen, friend, when you've been on both sides of the law, you understand how crooked the law can be. Believe me, let me tell you something. I don't mean the laws in the Constitution. I mean the people that are supposed to uphold the law. Uh, police officers, whatever the case may be, they can be some crooked people. Trust me. When you've been on the wrong side of it, you ain't too far off of what, what some of these civil servants are. Believe me. Trust me when I tell you that. That was free. It didn't cost you anything. All right. That's some good advice there. You take that home with you and remember that and hide that in your heart. Don't forget that. Amen? That's for real stuff right there. Believe me. I'm not saying this from a lack of experience. I've seen it. Well, the Lord had begin to deal with my father at this time and, and as I was out living in turmoil and wickedness my father was was getting closer to the Lord and God was and he was getting active in the church and God was and he was serving the Lord and living faithful to God and he was praying every day God give me back my sons God I ruined their lives give me back my sons Lord please don't let them die and go to hell let them die don't let them die and go to hell People were praying for me. People were, that didn't even know me were praying for me. Uh, you, want, you want to hear something? My wife that didn't even know me was praying for me. She was praying. God save his soul. God bring him back to you. Didn't even know she was praying for her husband. She had no idea. But God was moving. He was moving. And when God's moving, you know it. Because you know what? Literally, all hell breaks loose when God's moving. I mean, it shakes the very foundations of this earth, amen? When God starts moving in the lives of His people, something happens and the whole world starts shaking and He turns the whole world upside down with His people. Amen? It happens. Don't you forget it when God moves. And he was moving in my heart. He was, he was not in my heart yet, but it was starting to. Things were starting to unfold and happen. And, and God was answering prayers. And, and God was sending affliction my way. Because all of a sudden, the, the drugs were taking hold on me. And I wasn't doing the things that I was doing to make money anymore. And, and you know, the girl start, the, the, the lady that, the, the girl that I was fornicating with was, was starting to drift from me. I was, I was losing touch with all those things. Reality, I was losing touch with reality, and, and it was not the same anymore. And, and things were starting to happen. I didn't understand, and, and, and it started to get all out of control in my life. And I didn't know it was because God was moving in my life. I didn't know it was because he was searching me out in his mercy. And God did search me out, and, and some things started happening, and Boom, I lost the job. I lost the vehicle. I lost the girl. And the girl nearly, ki it nearly killed me losing her. I mean, I wanted to die. What I thought was love, it wasn't. I know that now after being married for 10 years that that wasn't love. <laughs> That was nothing but wicked lust that was consumed by the flesh, but it was not love. I didn't know that then, though. I thought it was, and I wanted to die. And, that, and I went back to my mom and dad's house, and the girl had left me in the middle of the night after five years of a relationship. At 2 o'clock in the morning, I get the phone, or she doesn't come back, and I go looking for her. And, and who's to come up but the cops and tell me, hey, listen, you got to get out of here. I'm like, I don't even know what's going on here. That, po that cop looked at me and he said, are you telling me that you came over here because your fiance, we were engaged at the time, you were coming over here to pick her up and you didn't know she was leaving you tonight? I said, no, I had no clue. He goes, you poor man. He goes, you just go home and get out of here and don't come back here, okay, because I don't want you to get in trouble. Just go home. He was very kind to me. He told me to go home and I went home and I, I wept for days. I tried to move back to Minnesota. That was in Illinois. I tried to move back to Minnesota and do some work and kind of live with my brother and try to get some things straight in my life and, and just to get out of there. And I tried it, and I, I came back to Minnesota, but God began to cause a ripple between me and my family and, and that, I, that I could not get along. I could, it couldn't function there. So the Lord began to deal with my heart, and I, and I, I went back home. And, and I, was telling, I was telling Pastor Brandon, I like those jacuzzi bathtubs, amen? 
and, and I began to read my Bible in those jacuzzi, one of those, my parents had one of those bathtubs, I began to read my Bible in that bathtub. Now, I fell asleep a couple times and dropped it in there. Boy, that makes a mess. Don't do that. It's really bad. Anyway, I began to read that Bible chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. What was happening? God was moving in my heart. I wasn't saved yet, but God was dealing with me. He was calling me. I didn't even know it. He was calling me. Listen, friend, don't you ever think that you sought out God first? Because he sought you out way before you ever sought him out. God was a looking for you, and I can prove that to you by the scriptures. Adam, where art thou? He went looking for Adam when Adam sinned. Adam didn't come looking for God. God called out and said, Adam, where art thou? Anyway, I, I, uh, I tried to go to church then. I said, okay, I'll go to church. I was still smoking pot. So I'd be getting high, and I'd, you know, I wouldn't get high before I'd go to church because that was just really weird. I wasn't going to try that. I felt like I'd get struck by lightning or something. So I waited until afterwards. But, uh, you know, lightning only strikes. You know, I waited until afterwards. And I'd, I'd get high, and I'd be like, man, them, them Christian people are weird. I was like, man, those little guys are pretty strange people. And I'm hiring a kite, and I'm thinking, I'm, they're strange. You're the one that's sucking on a weed. What's the matter with you? And I, I mean, I was doing dope, and I was thinking, man, them guys are weird. I tell people, man, them Christian people are strange, weird people. And, uh, you know, while well, I'm high, of course, and, I, and, I, and, I, you know, and God was dealing with my heart. I will never forget it in September of that year. Uh, this was right before 9-11 happened, actually, September of 2001. Uh, I, uh, I, remember, I remember first answering the call to preach, and I know that sounds strange because I wasn't saved. I could not explain it to you, but I wasn't. And um, I answered the call to preach that I, in a service that day, but I was still holding on to my sin. In fact, I remember we had a bus route. And I was working on this bus route, and I remember that Saturday night, this was a couple months later, on a Saturday night, I went out and just got drunk. And then I showed up, uh, Friday night, and then I showed up Saturday morning for the bus route. Oh, my goodness. I had a hangover. And I had to sit there with two or three people while they're screaming in my ear, and they're excited about Jesus, and I got a hangover. My head's just blowing up. And I'm sitting there, I was like, this must be punishment from God. Uh, and I, I, I sat there, and I, and, and I was dumbfounded by it. I'm, folks, I'm being real with you here. I'm just telling you the truth. I ain't got nothing to hide. I've been forgiven. You understand that? So I'm telling you the truth because I've already been forgiven. Amen? It's, it's not on me anymore. It's under the blood now. Amen? And I, I, I can say with all righteousness in the Lord, not in myself, but from imputed righteousness, that, that he's taken it away from me, and I know that I'm free. Amen? I'm free. And I... I, after that, I, I said, there must be something wrong with me. How, why in the world would I do that? Well, this old preacher came in, and uh, he preached a sermon. And uh, he preached a sermon. He, he pointed his bony finger out. He did this a few times over six months. He had, we, we, were, we went to another tent meeting or whatever, and he was there. And, he, and he, um, his first name, he was an evangelist. His name was Joe, and I can't think of his last name right, right now. But... Uh, and he pointed his finger, and he said, I believe the hottest spot in hell is reserved for that little Baptist church member that doesn't drop their pride and admit that they never got saved, and they're a lost sinner on their way to hell. I was like, who told that guy? What's going on here? Am I being watched? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't pointed his bony, Jack Parchman, Evangelist Jack Parchman, I don't know if you ever heard of him, that was his name, excuse me, and uh, Evangelist Jack Parchman, and he, old preacher, old tent preacher, revival preacher, and, and um, God began to deal with my heart, and the next day, I, at this time, by the way, let me say this, that I had seen my, over this, this period of time, I had seen my, uh, my future wife, and she was there, and, and, um, you know, I, I looked at this, 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 these girls, and, and I said, well, well I, 
folks, listen, there, there, are, there are three or four times in my life that I've said, God, I'm never doing this. And uh, I don't say that anymore because when I say I'm never doing this, I say, Lord, unless the Lord makes me do this, I'm not going to do this, all right? But uh, I looked, and I, I'm grateful for this one that he gave me, but the others I, I, I've, had to, I've had to pay for. <laughs> but but uh, I said, I'm never marrying this girl. I'm never marrying a girl like that. No way. I mean, it's as much as it, as it was with Nebuchadnezzar when that angel spoke from heaven and said, boy, you just sealed your fate right there. You are going to. And it was a good thing, by the way, amen. But I didn't know it was a good thing at that time. I didn't even understand. I didn't get it at all. But I was engaged to her, and we had gotten engaged after a few months. Her father first said no, and I don't blame him, because after I look back at it, there ain't no way I'd let somebody like me date my daughter. Not in a million years. Listen, I'm being honest with you. I wouldn't have. If you think he was my father-in-law was bad, I would have been way worse. Get out of here. Get away from my daughter. Don't you ever even look at her again. I'm serious, folks. I'm protective over my children. I will be. Amen. And, uh, and he, he was too, but he was cautious, and he, used, he, he allowed the Lord to lead him. But one day, after that preacher had preached that during this tent revival meeting, I, I was driving down the road. And I just, I began to feel so, so sick with conviction. I was what I call crippled with conviction. And I said, man, there is something wrong with me. And I talked to, and I called my future wife up, and I'm, I'm about 75 miles away. God gave me the longest trip of that day. I was a salesman selling windows and siding, and he gave me the longest trip of the trip that day to be thinking about what about the Lord being able to deal with me because I'm by myself on a 70-mile one-way trip, and I'm driving down the road, and, and God's just, just dealing with my heart. And I called my future wife, and I said to her, I said, I, I, she goes, what's wrong with you? I said, I, I don't believe I'm saved. I, I believe I'm lost. And she said, well, you, you can do something about that. And I said, well, I, I just need to, I need to get back, and I want to talk to that preacher. I said, I want to talk to the preacher a little bit and, and meet with him. And, and uh, she said, well, I wouldn't wait if I was you. And she was getting scared, you know, because she, all she can see is her future, her fiancé dying and going to a sinner's hell, getting in a car wreck on the way home and just burning in hell for all of eternity. But we understand that when God starts dealing with your heart, it's not something you can turn around and forget about, especially when it's salvation. He's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, God's gonna follow through, and you're gonna be convicted, and you're not gonna have any rest until you do. Well, I made that trip back, and I called the preacher, and I said, "Well, preacher, can you meet me in at the church building?" And he said, "No, but you can come out here." He had no idea what I was talking about, but God knew, and God was humbling me. Amen. And I had to go out there. And remember, I, by this time, I'm preaching the junior church for, the, for this church. And I'm doing all these other things as a lost man. And I get out there, and I remember sitting in front of this. I remember sitting in front of this preacher, and I said, I need to talk to you. And he said, yeah, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, I, I believe I'm lost. And he looked at me, and he said, well, 60, or 65, 70-year-old man looks at me and says, what are you going to do about it? Plain and simple. I said, I'm going to get saved. And he said, well, you don't need my help to do that. You just need to call out to God. And I remember at that point, I remember bowing my head. And I remember closing my eyes. And I remember crying out to Jesus and asking him for forgiveness. I remember asking him to forgive me of my wicked sins and to come into my heart and save me. And I'm telling you, when I was done praying, when I was done praying, I lifted up my eyes, I lifted up my head, and I began to weep like a baby. Because all those years of sin, all the weight of it all on my shoulders, 
everything weighing down my heart, the violated conscience, the wickedness of my life, it was forgiven. And I was set free. I was free. There's nothing like being free. The Son of Man shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. He doesn't set you free. He makes you free. That's good old King James for you. Amen. He makes you free. If I set you free, I could catch you again and enslave you. But when I make you free, you are made free. And God began to move in my heart then. I immediately got baptized that day that night at that revival meeting, and I stood up and I gave a testimony much, much like this to those at that meeting. And God has done a mighty work in my life since then. If you'd have told me 12 years ago I'd be preaching in a church in Texas and I'd be riding around in a Prius with a lawyer, if you'd have told me that last year, I'd have called you a liar. Wouldn't have believed it. A million years. I wouldn't have believed it. But it's God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. I, I take no credit for it. I, I don't brag about myself. I say, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I've been blessed by God. He has been so good to me. He gave me a wife and children and, a, and, and even a, a, a church to pastor. But I'll tell you something. None of it would have mattered if He didn't give me eternal life. None of it would have mattered if, I, if God would have impressed upon my heart to see my lost, wicked condition before Him and bow down before Him and trust Him as my Savior. He is my God and my Lord. And He has redeemed me, and I know that. Think about this one thing tonight. Make sure that you understand. Make sure that you know that you're born again by the Spirit of God. Make sure that you've, you've come in repentance and faith and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wasn't planning on preaching a gospel message or my testimony. But the Lord laid it on my heart when I heard that rock of ages and I thought about how good He's been to me. I thought about how, how everything that you and I do is all vanity, vanity. We do about this much for God. And if it wasn't for His wooing, we wouldn't even do that. But He's been merciful to us. So I say this as I close here with this, and I know it's not a long sermon, but therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's my testimony, folks. He made me new. Some people say to me, they say, well, you know, you preach really hard on a changed life. You preach, well, folks, I don't know a gospel that doesn't change someone. I don't know that one. I've never experienced that one. I was that hell-deserving, hell-bound sinner, chained with sin, chained with it, controlled by it, consumed by it. And He delivered me. I don't know that gospel that keeps you dead in trespasses and sins. I don't know the one that doesn't bring victory. I don't know the one that leaves me an enslaved addict to it. I don't know that one. I only know the one that changes men and makes them new. I know we battle the flesh, and we always will on this side, and we will grievously sin against our Lord. But I also know that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Our faith is an experienced faith. It is a lived-out faith from a changed life not by any works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Just like that song said, in my hands no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I have nothing else to offer Him. I could not save myself and I could not offer Him anything. 
All I could do was trust Him. All I could do was turn to Him and believe Him. Folks, I think we have a lot of people in our churches today, and I'm not making any accusations here. I'm just simply saying we have a lot of people in churches today that have never experienced being born again by the Spirit of God. They have never been chained, changed and made new creatures. They're trying to live the Christian life as lost people. And they can't do it. You'll never do it. I tried to do it, folks. I mean it. Listen to me. I was preaching a junior church. I was, I was going on bus calling. I was going out soul winning. I was doing all those things as a lost man. And the first chance that I had to sin, I did. Now, I'm not saying a saved person won't sin because they will, but I'm just simply saying that I had no power over the lust of the flesh. But when he saved me, he gave me a new nature. And with that new nature came a new look on life. All things become new. Amen? What does that mean? That means I have a new look on life. I have a new look on what sin is. I don't see sin the same way as a saved person any longer, do you? Once you get born again, sin don't look as pleasant as it did before. You know why? Because you see past the sin and you see the consequences for those actions and it ain't pretty. God opens up those consequences, shows you those consequences and shows you what can happen. Folks, I can't preach anything else than what I have seen and what I have heard. Just like the apostle said, we can't but teach and preach the things that we have seen and heard. And this is that new life in Christ. Make sure that you know that. Make sure that you have that and then walk in it. Walk in the spirit that you've not fulfilled the lust of the flesh. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let the word of God go forth in your life in all richness and goodness. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your love and forgiveness and compassion for us. Lord, we're not worthy. If this program has touched your heart, contact us at Faith Baptist Church, telephone 903-785-6038, or on the web at www.theoldtimeway.com, or come by for church with us at 804 14th Northeast in Paris, Texas.